going to be looking over four different uh, teaching software tools for about 10 minutes each. I would ask you to hold your questions and we'll have a about a 15 minute uh, discussion at the end. Um, and the whole point of this, you know, we call it a tech tasting, and this is the first one that we're doing in this format. Um, the idea is just to give you a, a, a look at it, just to have some of the faculty members who are experienced using these platforms to kind of go over the features of them so that you know if this is something you want to continue uh, to explore or not. And uh, my colleague Greg Meyer is here, um, who's going to help us uh, help you know how you can learn more about doing that. So um, the chat is open. We should all be able to chat with each other. So you're welcome to use the chat as well. And um, Lindsay, are you ready to go? I am. Um, we'll still have more people come in. So the other thing is keeping on time. So we have about 10 minutes for each person. And um, as your game show host today, I may uh, give you a one minute warning or something like that when we need to move on. So take it away. All right, sounds good. So my name is Lindsay Skaggs, and I'm an instructional design librarian at Milner Library. And I um, am going to share with you Nearpod today, which is a tool that I really enjoy using. So I will share my screen so that we can take a look at it, uh, and then we'll get started. So let me get into, there we go. Okay, so I am in Nearpod right now. And what I wanna show you is how you can use this tool both synchronously and asynchronously in your classroom. Now, what I like about Nearpod or how I describe it to my colleagues is that it is really a tool that allows you to package information and order it in a specific way and then intersperse it with active learning activities. So it's almost in a sense like using say a PowerPoint presentation where you, you know, can create different slides and put together different materials, but Really, the, the thing that makes Nearpod different is that there is this level of interactivity to it. So I'll show you first a Nearpod tutorial that I created for the School of Nursing to help students learn how to use APA 7, just so that we can see how you might use this in your classroom. And this particular module was something that I created for asynchronous use. So as I'm in my Nearpod, library here. I can create, you know, as many different modules as I want. And I've got this lesson that I've already created. So I'm going to go into the edit mode so that you can see what this looks like once you put together a module. So as I get into, you know, a, a certain lesson that I've put together, and let me see, I'm going to see if I can move my zoom toolbar to my other monitor you have just different components and different slides that you can put together. So as I look through what I have here in Nearpod, I've actually uploaded slides from PowerPoint just directly into Nearpod. So if you have a lesson that you've already created, it's really easy just to put it into Nearpod and then create other components. So for example, here, I've got a quiz, I've got a video in here, um, and some other different types of content. So I'm just going to go into preview mode, so that you can see how a student would experience using this asynchronous module. So as I get into this preview mode, you know, I'm just starting with some slides to help them learn how to use APA 7th and learn a little bit about citation. So I've got an introduction here. And again, these are just PowerPoint slides that I've uploaded. So information on, on just background, citing, what's APA style. And then I have a quiz just to gauge what students might already know about citing and to, um, you know, get an idea, some assessment of what they already know and so forth. So I've just got a couple of different quiz questions here that I'll go through. Now, one thing that I wish was a little bit different about Nearpod is that as students answer quiz questions, it'll tell them if they've gotten, um, you know, the question correct, but it doesn't, if I got it incorrect, it doesn't tell me, um, you know, what the correct answer is and why. So I do have slides here that I uploaded so that it will explain to my students, you know, these are the correct answers and why. So that's what I've had for a couple of slides here. And then I have a video. So you can embed videos into your Nearpod. In this example, I actually used um, Camtasia to create a video. And I rendered that as an MP4 on my computer, just uploaded it into Nearpod. But alternatively, if you have YouTube videos that you'd want to put into a lesson, you can just grab the URL and put it into Nearpod and it will create, you know, 
embed the video into the lesson for you. So it's really easy to use in that way. So I've got a video here that I created. Um, then, you know, a few more slides and I'll just, you know, scan through these that students would go through. And then we've got some other types of material. So in this case, I have a PDF that I created, you know, a little chart of how students can uh, learn to cite materials. And this is in the PDF viewer. So students would be able to just download this directly to um, their computer and keep it for later. Um, I also am able to put in websites here so I, they can click on this and open, you know, open the Milner Library Guide to look at APA style in another browser, keep that open, come back to it later. And then I have another quiz. So this is just an example of how I've used Nearpod. Um, one thing with the quizzes is that often these are just multiple choice, but you can put in different audio or images. So for example, here, I want students to look at a citation and then, um, you know, ascertain whether or not it's correct or if something's wrong with it. Um, and you can put in those sorts of materials. So this is what a module might look like that I use asynchronously. And as you put together a Nearpod module, you have different options for the types of content that you can put together like you have seen in this example. So if I click on add a slide, it's so easy to use. I can come in here and just say, oh, I wanna add a video. I wanna add a slide. I wanna link out to a website. Now Nearpod does have some different types of content that are already embedded that personally I haven't used. I think it's a little bit more appropriate for the K-12 classroom like the 3D FET simulation and VR field trips as well as this BBC Worldwide, but it's certainly something you can play around with. Or you can just put in slides, you can put in audio, upload PDFs, and those are the kind of static content components that you might add here. And then with activities, you have the ability to add in open-ended questions, do matching pairs, add the quiz like you saw. Um, in my example, you can add in Flipgrid really easily. There's also collaborative boards, whiteboards, polls, fill in the blanks. So everything that you see here, you can just kind of play around with. And I would say the barrier to entry here is low. You can just come in here and, and test things out and see what might work for you. Now, as students complete um, these modules, and I'm just going to get out of this, um, you can run reports in Nearpod to, you know, see how students are answering questions. Now, the one thing that um, I wish was maybe a little bit different about Nearpod is that it doesn't integrate with the ReggieNet uh, gradebook. So you would have to come into Nearpod and actually, you know, get the grades that way. But via the reports, which, you know, given our time constraint, I'm not going to show, you can come in here and just download a report in CSV and get everyone's quiz scores, or you can read, um, you know, what they've written for, for short answers or things like that. So with this um, APA module that I created, as I hover over it, you can see I've got a couple different options for sharing. I could do live participation to use this synchronously, or I could do the student paste, which is how I've created this particular module because students do it on their own time. Now, when I click on this student paste, it will create um, a code for me. And then I can, you know, send out a link to my students and say, this is the link that you're going to use to use Nearpod. I could embed it into ReggieNet. Um, or, you know, there's some other options here that you can see. So it's really easy to take it and put it into, into other, um, into, you know, ReggieNet or whatever it's using to send it as an email to students, that sort of a thing, whatever works best for you. Um, you can put a time limit here for how long the module is going to be available. And you can have multiple different, um, I guess, implementations of it. So for example, if I wanted to use this module for different courses, but then when I run the reports, I want to have it broken out into different courses, um, you know, so I can look at, you know, students for course A versus students for course B, you know, I'm able to do that. So that's another thing that's nice about using Nearpod. Now, in my remaining couple minutes here, I do also want to show you how this can be used synchronously because that is something that's really cool about Nearpod. So I've got just a little Nearpod features um, lesson that I created. And if I choose live participation here, what's going to happen is that as the teacher, I am going to be able to control how the Nearpod flows. And I would say to my students, okay, we're in a live session. You can just minimize your Zoom and you can go to join.nearpod.com and you can just you know, grab this code 
and, and get into the lesson. So I'm gonna bring over another browser just really shortly here so you can see what this would look like for a student. So a student's going to go to join.nearpod.com. We'll just put in their uh, code here. It'll take maybe a moment here to load. And then they can put in their name. You can require that they use um, you know, their Microsoft name, but then they'll get into the, the actual Nearpod lesson. And as an instructor, I can see here, just in the lower corner here, that I've got you know, a couple of students that have joined my lesson. So as I click through my slides, um, what's going to happen is that as an instructor, I'm going to be able to see if students are responding to the various activities I have. So in this case, I have a poll. So if you were looking at the student view, students are gonna see a poll, but me as the instructor, I can um, come in here and see, okay, are students actually answering this? And I'm in my other monitor here, you know, doing the answer. So I can see, okay, yes, Lindsay says she has used this before. And then as I progress through the slides, um, you know, what will happen is that as, as the instructor here, I can just see how people are responding real time. So for this one, I've got just a question. And again, I'll bring my little browser over here again. You know, do I have any plans this summer? Plans? I don't know. I can submit this as a student and then as the instructor, it will pop up. So sometimes there's a little bit of a, of a time delay here, but I can see in real time how my students are responding to it. So it's a pretty cool thing. There is the ability to um, draw. So I don't know if someone who's watching this wants to draw something, it will pop up as they do so. Um, but there are these nice little things that you can do um, using you know, different collaborative boards and things like that. And as the instructor, I can control it and I can control you know, the amount of time it takes to like push through the different components. So it's kind of hard to show how you use this synchronously in, in this sort of a setting, but I would really encourage you to play around with this because it is a tool that has a lot of different applications for getting students involved, whether you do it in the classroom period or outside of it. So I know I'm coming up on my, on my time here, but hopefully this will get you a little bit excited about using Nearpod. Lindsay, thank you so much. I think it's also important for us to mention that Nearpod is uh, what is being intended on campus to replace the old turning point clicker system. Nearpod, there's a there's a campus license for it, so students no longer have to buy uh, a subscription. Um, so we're reducing costs for students as well. Um, Lindsay, thank you again. So if you have questions about Nearpod, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Lindsay will be sticking around and answer some questions during our last 15 minutes. But we want to, you know, uh, again, this is a tasting, so we're not going to gorge ourselves on any one particular item on the buffet. Let's move on to Padlet. So Grace Kang is going to be talking about that. All right. Hi, everyone. So I will share a little bit about Padlet today. And um, it's definitely not as um, complicated, I would say, as Nearpod. It does offer some um, tools and um, unique features that you can use um, for a variety of purposes. So I just put in a uh, a link to a Padlet into the uh, chat. And so if you can go ahead and click on that, you'll see um, how this is one way you can use it. It's a very simple way, but it's kind of nice to get a pulse on your, how your students are doing. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And so this is the link to uh, what you should have seen. So I just, it's sometimes I'll use Padlet in this way just to get a pulse on how students are feeling. And so I'll, I'll plug this link into my, um, my Google Slides or Nearpod, right, or any any platform you're using, and just to get uh, see how they're doing. And this is a fun one um, to how you're feeling today. So if you all want to put in a little GIF or a meme, um, and to see, so we can kind of see um, how we're doing. Um, so a lot of times, I'll what what first I'll say what is Padlet. So Padlet is like a visual corkboard um, that you can use for various purposes, and um, I've used it for polls, for back channel discussions, for a virtual gallery walk. Um, discussion responses, icebreaker activities, kind of like this, um, as well as uh, opportunities for group work where students can post um, what they're discussing. And so that's just several ways you could use it. There's a host of other ways as well. Um, so, you know, this kind of just gives us a quick idea of how we're doing today on this 
uh, lovely Monday morning of the last week of the semester. And so um, I will also just show you two ways I'm going to use it with my students today. I have class actually at 10, so I'll be leaving a little early. So these are two um, kind of icebreakers we're going to do together. So I'm asking, uh, what are you binge watching or watching right now? And so I just put in two things I'm watching. So I'm watching, I just watched for RC Blues last night, and I'm really into K dramas at the moment. So I've been talking about, I just posted how I watched a K drama called Startup. So those are some fun ways that you can use it. Um, I'm also going to use it today as share a compliment with our amazing class because it's the last day of last class of the semester. And so what are ways that we can talk about how how awesome everybody in our class is. Um, so those are just some fun, uh, easy ways to kind of use it. I've also used it for group work. Um, actually, that's not the group work that I'd like to share. Actually, this was for more of a, a clinical fellows group that I'm a part of. And we shared, we broke up into small breakout rooms and then we were talking about these guiding questions and larger ideas. And so then each group um, over here talk, instead of coming to that point where you're like, okay, can every group share about what they talked about? Um, they were able to, we took notes as we um, were in our group sessions. And then this was just available to everybody. And the really neat thing about it is it's in real time. And so that as every group posts their um, notes or whatever discussion points, then we could all share that and see it. And so, um, and the neat thing also too in settings, you can change if you want it to have likes or if you want it to have stars or if you wanna have a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and then you can also have that, um, opportunity to add a comment and um, so then that can also keep the discussion going as well um, and so I've also used it for discussion posts and so this was on a critical reflection that my students had done several readings about and then I gave them um, several guided questions and um, then they responded to it the various questions and I found this to be actually much more engaging and interactive because then the students could read each other's because in the past they just submitted it in Reginet um, and then the neat thing I also asked them to um, connect it to something in larger society so uh, you know a TED talk or an image or a uh, article or a website, a link, and they posted different um, memes and GIFs, but um, more importantly, really good uh, resources and articles um, and uh, videos and that I think was really helpful to my students to, to read each other's. Um, and then I also use that as an opportunity to comment and give them feedback uh, this way. Um, I didn't have them write back to each other. Uh, they have done that in other posts. But this one was really just something for me, for I was going to comment on. But um, they also have commented on each other's as well. Um, another way I've used it is using it as a gallery walk. And so this was an activity where they posted their various identity maps. And then um, this was where they needed to write to each other. And so you could see that they have comments about um, how viewing each other's um, work and then going ahead and uh, responding to each other. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, how you could, what this looks like when you're getting started with it. So those were just some examples of how you could use it. And uh, based on your goal and your purpose of what you want to use this for, um, it'll, that will depend on how you want to um, pick your, your, your layout. And so once you say you want to make a Padlet, it'll ask you what kind of layout that you want. And so this shows that if you, if I was going to use it for a back channel discussion, which I have before, um, where it's a chat, um, if we're having like a, we had a Socratic seminar in class, and then we use the back channel discussion feature for the students that weren't in that discussion to go ahead and jot down their thoughts. And then we could all view each other's uh, back channel comments. Um, if I wanted to use it for what I just created, um, to see how things are going, then I may go over here. And it's the great thing about it is that it's very quick to create. And so I could go over here to grid and it gives you this like set background, but you can change anything that you want. So there's, the, I can go ahead and change my title, um, description, um, and then it gives you an automatic link 
to um, that you can cut and paste to wherever you want to post that to. And then this is where all of those features that I talked about earlier, um, if you want to think about how you want them to post where it's going to lay out in the front or the end, the beginning or the end of the screen, um, if you want them to allow comments, and then these reactions, if you want them to be able to put a like or a vote or a star or none of the above. Um, and then you can do some uh, content filtering as well. And then um, after that, um, you can go ahead and then change some of the privacy features on here. So like over here, you'd want to go over here to change privacy. Um, if you want to just to be for your class, typically I do secret and then you want to allow them to write. That was something I didn't figure out right away because then my students weren't able to comment or post. And I was like, why is that not working? And so you have to go back and do that. So I think the really neat thing about Padlet is it's very easy to use. It's user friendly. Um, you can um, use it for whatever your purpose is and how you want to use it. And um, you can just use it literally make one in a minute and use it in class <laughs> you know very very quickly so i think that's one of the things that i really like about it and that um it's also you can make it as interactive as you want it to be or you can make it very much like uh, an a assessment that you want to be able to uh, see what their discussion posts were like or a response to a reading um, or it can be something silly just like what we did like about how are we feeling today and just to get a pulse on how things are going. And so you can see pretty quickly, everyone's pretty tired just from looking at those memes and GIFs. And so that's, I think that's pretty much all I have for that. So, but hope it's a tool that people enjoy. And the really neat thing about it is that now um, Illinois State has some licenses. And that was great because when I was using the free version, I had to keep deleting um, different Padlets so that I could make a new one because you're only allowed, I think, like five or six free ones. And so it's nice that Illinois State has that, that little, the license now. Thanks so much. Thank you, Grace, very much. Uh, so folks, if you have questions for Grace, um, so she's going to be leaving a little early. Uh, my colleague, Greg Meyer, can also answer questions about Pod Padlet, I hope. But you can also put those in chat right now if you want to. And um, we'll also uh, show you where you can uh, request one of those Padlet licenses. There's a form to fill out. We have a limited number of them on campus, but we're more than happy to uh, point you in that direction. In fact, Greg just put that form in chat right now. So. Uh, let's move on to Carolyn, who's going to talk about Flipgrid. Carolyn, you're muted. Thank you very much. I there you go. It. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a rough morning getting up. I live in Idaho, so I'm an hour earlier than everybody else here. So I'm trying to get going this morning. So Flipgrid is a great tool. I've been using it for quite some time now. I um, have been teaching online for six years for Illinois State. So I've been able to test out a lot of these fun pieces of software for online learning for quite some time. Flipgrid is something that we use for video engagement, at least in my different classes. So some of the things that I use them for are introductions, getting kids ready, getting them started, getting to know each other, especially in an online environment where they don't get to sit down in class and get to see each other. Um, I've used them for video journals to help them synthesize the content that they're learning um, and help them consolidate that into short little videos to, to make them really think about what it is they're looking at. And then I also use it for reflections at the end of the semester for them to go back over and think about what they've done and talk about it in a creative and fun way. Um, I think we all get tired of the talking head from time to time. So I have a couple of samples of each of those and I'll just play a few few minutes of each of those so that you can kind of get a feel for what it can be like. You can do the talking video head. Hi, I'm Brooke Covey and I'm from Springfield, Illinois. My two truths in a lie is that I love online shopping. I did cheer throughout all of high school and I just love interacting through Zoom with my professors and classmates. It is so much fun. So, Hi, I'm Brooke. so I told them that their lie had to be what they loved about online learning. And that allowed me to be able to kind of get a sense of what I was fighting once we switched over into the online environment for all classes, um, not just my class, but for all. And so I could get a, a pulse on that. And then I was able to go back and comment on each of their videos and give them something positive about the online world to kind of combat what they were 
so fearful about or what they were that I knew that they were going to go in hating. But it was a great thing. And so I have the students come in and then they can video comment on each other's and we'll look at the platform in just a minute. But this is one that they did a video log where they were taking, they had to do it in, I think it's five minutes or less was what they had to do was summarize the chapter. And they went through and this group was really creative. Look, there are three parts of data organization for files. Files are the major collection of data used for applications. The record is considered the highest level of data in a file that contains a unit of information. Within the records, there are fields used to consecutively store and reserve an atom of data. I'll never join you! If you only knew the power of COBOL. Only one never told you what you can do with COBOL. He told me enough! So you can see that they did a voice over a video to try to synthesize. Now, most of what I teach is computer programming languages, which can be kind of a dry topic, especially um, for an online environment. It's hard to get super excited about it, but they did a great job with it. Um, then they went on and changed it a little bit and did like they were chatting with each other online and talking about how to solve the problem at hand. So they were able to really creatively look at that um, and, and, and change it and post that up there. And then we watched that at the beginning of every class session, um, which was really nice so that we could summarize the chapter really quickly um, and then allow us to, then I could correct any misnomers um, if there were any, and then we can move into working through problems and helping them that way. And then the last example here is just quickly doing a reflection. And I tell them, I don't want just a talking head. I want them to creatively put something together. Uh, and then I give them an example. Welcome to my reflection. So I have a few questions for them to answer. This is a, a system called Powtoons, which I absolutely love. It takes uh, PowerPoint and puts it on steroids for them very easily to use to animate things throughout. And so they can submit their reflections that way and they've answered my questions, but they've done it in a more fun environment. And then they can talk to each other that way. So if we look at the next, come on, there we go. If we look at this next one here, the platform, the the back, the front end here, when you're looking at this as an instructor, we can see, and the students, they can see everybody's posts, who's posted when. Um, I can look and see when I click on it. Um, um, who all has viewed it. Um, and then I can add my comments to it directly there. Um, I can come in and export the data as well. So as an instructor, you can see they've got one comment here for Logan, but it's been seen five times. Spencer has two comments. And so we can come down and look at their comments, who's commented and their video commenting on each other's. So we get a chance to really talk to each other in a sense that way. Um, as an instructor, I can download the data as well, which is really nice because sometimes it's faster to read than to listen to everything if I'm just looking for a quick overview. And it, it allows me to see who it is that's posted here by name, um, when they created it. I can see that these are the people that they've replied to, how long their videos are, and then they actually give you a transcript of it. Of course, now that's probably not 100% accurate, but it gives you a good idea of what's there. And so when I'm having them comment on these things, especially like these two truths and a lie, I tell them that I want them to find a connection. So the point is for them to watch their peers, but then to find something they connect on and respond to that so that they're connecting to each other. And then as we do group work throughout the semester, it makes it easier because they feel like they know a few of their peers in that setting. So I know we don't have a whole lot of time, um, to, to, do, to show you much more, but as you um, have questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer those for you. 
Carolyn, thank you. I think one other important thing to note about Flipgrid is that it is actually, this is not the important part, but it, it's important for getting access to it. It's owned by Microsoft now, which means it's actually part of our Office 365 license. So if you log in and create your Flipgrid account using your at ilstu.edu email address, you'll have the access to the full instructor suite that Carolyn has showed us. Um, and um, when you create a, uh, a channel or a classroom for your particular class, you can put in your students' ILSTU email addresses so that way it will associate names and, and all of that other stuff. So that's a pretty handy thing too. So Carolyn, thank you so much. Let's go on to Allison, who's gonna talk about Edpuzzle. to find my unmute button. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about Edpuzzle. I've been using Edpuzzle for quite a while now. Um, and now that ISU has a license, it's even better. So what I do first is I start cr by creating modules. Um, I use Screencast-O-Matic, um, you know, with PowerPoint or Google Slides um, and just create my, my actual module. Um, and when I create my module, um, I it with Screencast-O-Matic, um, if it's under 15 minutes, it's free. Um, I actually pay for the, the subscription, but um, you have some different options with Edpuzzle. You can upload, you can download the actual video to your computer and then just upload it into the, the Edpuzzle framework, or you can directly um, put it to a YouTube video and then you put it through YouTube on listed channel, you're able to, um, uh, edit your closed captioning uh, and send it right to Edpuzzle, which is nice. So when you upload it to Edpuzzle, um, it'll prompt you to if you want to cut the video um, so you can can make it shorter for your students. You can use voiceovers. Um, that does not work with YouTube. Uh, however, I don't actually ever use uh, voiceovers, um, but you can. That is an option. And you can add engaging questions um, such as multiple choice questions, open ended questions and adding notes, which I'll talk about now. So you can actually, these, these questions, there's, I've gone up to like five different uh, multiple choice questions. You can also have the open-ended questions where you just ask a question and you might have two or three and you can just add a couple questions and embedded within that video. And, um, or you can have this note section. It's awesome um, for Edpuzzle because you can give immediate feedback too. Um, unlike Nearpod, um, this, this allows you to say, oh, you got the answer right or wrong. You got it right. This is correct. Here is why it's correct. Um, so we'll, it will give you that, that option to give that feedback. Um, so after you upload, what do you do now? So there's a couple things that's going to prompt you to do. You can edit, you can duplicate the video, or you can assign it to a class. And the cool thing about assigning it to a class is when you push on assigning to the class, it's going to come up with a list of your classes that you've already populated. Um, you can actually click on um, multiple classes to assign it to multiple sections if you're teaching more than one section of a class, which is nice. You can um, decide when you want it opened, when you want um, it to shut. So if you have an assigned time that you want it shut, that's perfect. Um, prevent skipping. This allows you, your students, they have to watch the video. They can't fast forward through it the first time. So once they finish that video and they want to review some of the different content, then they're able to go back and um, rewatch it and fast forward. But they have to watch it the first time all the way through, um, including um, answering all of the questions. You can also uh, turn on that closed captioning feature to make it more accessible for your students. Um, and then once your students are in, you are you have the option of adding your students um, into the My Classes option. So you, you click on your My Classes and you find all of your the section that you want and you're looking at their assignments. And so all of your modules are, are set here. Um, if they have a due date, um, it will be under due assignments um, or no due date. How do you get your students involved is you click on that class member, that third option here, um, and it'll generate a code for you. And so the code, you copy link. I usually add that link right to my ReggieNet page, and this is my first activity for week one. Um, but you have the option of sharing that code out to your, your students too. And once they're in your class, they will see the exact same page that I have here where they will see each of the modules when it's due on the start date and if they've turned it in. 
which is which is nice. In order to grade an Edpuzzle, um, you will just click on each of your different modules and it will come up with uh, this, this next form here where we'll tell you all of your students and if they completed that module or not. You'll have, you can click on any of these buttons. You can do it by grade, you can do it by watched. I always do it by watched. And I see if the students are, um, I see if the students are, um, have watched the video. The one thing that I will caution you is if students have logged into Edpuzzle using two or three or four different email addresses, it will tell you that they did not watch the module, but they in fact may have watched it using a different um, login information. And so there's a couple of things that you can do. You can lock after the first week, you can lock your, your students in so nobody can actually go into your your settings um, again, so that they can't they can't um, use a different login, or you can just scroll through and make sure that they have completed it by having them write their you know real name. Um, you have some different options for grading, which is nice for your students. You can actually push mark all is graded, and it grades everything for you. You're still able to see all of their answers. I have hidden my students, but you you can see all of their answers, which is nice or you can individually comment to students. So if you notice that a student was completely off base, um, you can add a comment, it'll email your student and uh, tell them that they have a comment from their professor, which is nice. Um, under my content, it will log all of the different content aspects for you. Um, and then you can create folders using move to a folder to make sure that everything is organized if you're teaching multiple classes. Um, on the up hand right hand corner there's a grade book so you can click on grade book and your students will be listed and you will see all the modules that you have created throughout the semester and if they have completed the modules or not you see that this student has not completed some. Um, sharing work, this is an awesome feature for Edpuzzle if you are teaching a, a section and colleagues are teaching another section instead of recreating the wheel. You can share um, work and you can see everybody else's work within Edpuzzle. And so you're going to click on content on the right left hand side. You're going to see Illinois State and then you'll see a bunch of teachers. So you'll click on that. You'll you'll click on the different professors that are the professor that you want. Unfortunately, Edpuzzle doesn't have it in the nice little, you know, organizational set up that you have it in your my content so you might have to scroll through a bunch of different modules in order to get to the module that you want to share but then you just click on the little the little um module and then share it to your students and it automatically puts into your my content and then you can organize it how appropriately you need under settings um so you'll click on your little icon and go into settings you can once you're assigning everything you can automatically say this is I want it to prevent skipping and I want the closed captioning always on for accessibility. Um, and then under school, this is how you can connect it to ISU. So um, the best option, if you haven't joined Edpuzzle, log in with your ISU account. It's gonna, it's gonna prompt you automatically to add it as a pro account. Um, and then if you already have the Edpuzzle account, this is the school code. Um, and so that way it'll connect you to the school code. Ooh, I think I made it in 10 minutes, maybe. <laughs> I, I think so too. And you actually answered a question that I had, which is how do we gain access to it? So thank you for that. You're um, we have about 20 minutes left in our session. So um, before we uh, open it up to, to questions, uh, let me once again, thank our presenters um, for giving us this little taste of these different technologies. Um, we'll talk here in a moment about some support pages we have on CTLT's website and where you can get some additional help and what workshops will we intend to offer this summer on the, these topics. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Rosie Hauk, who's uh, here with us today. Uh, Rosie is uh, over in Technology Solutions and was one of the innovators of this uh, session today and uh, hopefully some of you attended a, a similar one that she and I think Doug Smith did on Friday talking about the in classroom technology that's been put in over the very, very long academic year. So let me go ahead and open it up to questions. What I'm going to ask you to do is just go ahead and um, 
use, uh, you can either put a question in the chat and we'll try to answer those, but there's also a reactions button on the bottom of your screen, a little smiley face, and you can raise your hand. That will put you up to the top of the list and we can call on you and then you can unmute yourself and turn your camera on uh, and talk. I should also remind you, by the way, that this session is indeed being recorded. So uh, we'll open it up to questions. Hi, Jim. I have a question. I can raise my hand for some okay. reason. That's fine. Go ahead. In the, in the reactions. Um, you know, thank you to, to the old presenters. There are, there were great ideas. Maybe my question is to, to you, Jim, or Greg, um, especially to those of you who are familiar with soft chalk. So, um, I, you know, some of these new tools that I we've seen today, I mean, they're great. But um, for example, it puzzle to me reminds me a little bit like you know some some of the soft chalk features. What I would like to know is actually kind of comparing and contrasting soft chalk to some of these tools. I was just getting ready to update some of my modules in soft chalk, but as I've seen like at puzzle and maybe some of the others. I mean, these are great. Um, I am wondering now whether I should switch. So I was wondering whether any of you has, you know, some ideas, you know, about pros and cons, you know, with soft chalk compared to these tools. Thank you. So, so I haven't used soft chalk in a long time. I'll, I'll take a first swing at this. And then Greg, if you want to chime in, you're more than welcome to. I think the first, the first rule of incorporating technology into your teaching and into your students learning is that you have to use what works for all of you. So if you've been having perfectly good outcomes using soft chalk, there's no necessary, there's not necessarily a reason to change. So soft chalk is an old school version of some of the features that we've talked about in a couple of these different platforms that we've previewed today. Um, soft chalk uses older technology that is, it's basically a website that's hosted someplace and then you link it in with another website like Reginet. And I think the interactivity isn't going to be quite as much as you would get for some of these things like Edpuzzle and everything else. But if you have existing modules and existing lessons, um, and it's not an impediment for your students to get to them because you're obviously linking them again through the learning management system or something else, uh, there may not necessarily be a reason to change. So I think that's kind of the high altitude answer. Um, I would be more than happy to connect you with Charles uh, Bristow, who you may have worked with before at CTLT, who is kind of our soft chalk guru. Um, and he might be able to, to give you more of a, a point by point comparison to some of these. But I think the, I think the big answer is if you have a lot of lessons that are built out and you're already using them in soft chalk that there's not necessarily a reason to change. Um, unless you're looking for more immediate feedback during a synchronous session with your students or, you know, hopefully in the fall face to face session where something, for example, like Nearpod, again, being the clickers replacement might be more appropriate to use. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I used soft chalk before and I have switched to these others, at least with Edpuzzle and things, it's nice that I can embed them in ReggieNet so my students aren't actually leaving ReggieNet to go do this, they can do these activities right in ReggieNet so that they're, even though they have to sign up with, for a couple of different technologies, they're mm -hmm. still embedded within ReggieNet so that they're not getting lost somewhere else and then have to find their way back. Mm -hmm. uh, grade books don't necessarily line up, which is still a feature that I wish would work, but it's not, it's, it's less of a hassle for me to deal with that end of things mm -hmm. than to have them get lost. So I can't find, or why is it, it down? Or I had the worst luck with soft chalk and, and Charles and I, he tried his best, but I had to give up on that, that end of things. And okay. I love the, the more updated technology with, with Nearpod and, and Edpuzzle and Padlet and all of these others. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. I think that's a great point. It's uh, I would think of all of these newer uh, applications we're talking about as kind of pre-shrunk and ready to wear. They may not do everything that you can do in a soft chalk a score module in soft chalk, but if there are certain features that you really rely on soft chalk to use, you may find that there are analogous features in, in another one. So having forum discussions or conversations or embedding video or something like that. I see Tracy has her hand up. Tracy, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? I'm going to lower your hand or you've lowered your hand even better. Hey there, I put this in the chat, but I just want to clarify, am I correct that none of these directly integrate with ReggieNet Gradebook at this time? Yes, that is correct. So ReggieNet Gradebook integration is very, very limited. And usually there are 
uh, custom modules to go in. So even stuff like Microsoft OneNote and Microsoft Teams that we've had relationships with Office 365 for five years now on campus, there is not an integration uh, built in for Sakai that we have access to. Okay, just wanted to double check, thank you. What other questions do we have? So Jim, I oh, just, hi, um, hi. Um, awesome job, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, for attending and for, for doing this. Um, I just put a link for Edpuzzle in there. Um, and what we'll do is um, just sign up for Edpuzzle using your ILSTU EDU account. Um, and we'll grab anything with uh, at ILSTU.edu, we grab and give you a license. Um, and so what CTLT has on their website is remains correct. You just sign up like you normally would and we'll grab your um, your accounts um, and add it to the license. And you'll see it because I think there'll be a little Illinois State uh, folder that appears on the left side. And that's how I knew, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm in now. Um, so that's all you have to do. And I think that covers all, all of them, how to get access. So, cool. Thank you very much. I'm gonna quickly segue. I'm gonna briefly share my screen and I just wanna show you where you can go get help. Um, like, what is our next step? That, we're, that we might be uh, looking to do. Oh, you guys all disappeared. Let me move you over here. So um, you should see CTLT's webpage. Do you see that on your screen here? Okay, so if you go to the main CTLT website and you click on technology, you'll see we have this kind of landing page with all of our classic hits like uh, ReggieNet and Zoom. And you'll see that some of these have graduated, three of them of the four have graduated to the, to the top page. So Flipgrid, Nearpod and Padlet. And on each of these pages, We've broken down what you can do with it, how to get it. Uh, and we link to not only support materials that we have, but moreover support materials that uh, the companies host. And also a lot of these are created by other instructors and other institutions. So these are all available for you to use. For Edpuzzle, the link that um, Rosie just put in the chat, go here to teaching software. And this is a list of other software that we know faculty are using, but are not necessarily supported on campus. Edpuzzle is currently listed here. It's going to graduate to that top page at some point uh, over the summer when I get some time. But you can go here and, as Rosie mentioned, oh, dramatic pause. Um, so again, it shows you it shows you that stuff. So how to get it? Uh, again, we'll add a line here that says "sign in with your ISU email address." So I just wanted to kind of point out that that was available as well. So ctlt.illinoisstate.edu, click on technology, and you should be able to find that and much more uh, there. So what other questions do we have? We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, Rosie, you have your hand up and then Tracy. So I, I have to uh, log off for my next meeting, but I just wanna say thank you again for coming and hopefully you like this format. Um, my, like uh, Jim said, uh, we worked hard to, you know, get these licenses, but I'm like, I want to get them out so people can use them since we're now paying for them. Um, and so hopefully this is something, the little tech tasting where you can get a little taste of some of the cool things that we're bringing in, um, whether in the classroom uh, or, you know, educational technologies, maybe even research technologies eventually um, to, to be available to you. So look out um, for that coming, coming forward. Um, if you have any requests, I see cahoots on here. Um, please send it to me um, and I'll try to, you know, dig around and, you know, uh, see what, you know, we can do and who uses it. Obviously, all these technologies were already being used in the classroom in some way, shape or form with some front runners. Um, and so, you know, mm -hmm. we already have the expertise here. CTLT um, also is very familiar. So there seems like no reason for us not to support it centrally. Um, and so, yeah, and if you're interested, um, we did do a classroom technology tasting on Friday. We recorded the session, but um, again, it was, you know, that one was only half an hour and it shows um, a setup for a suddenly blended classroom. If you have to suddenly uh, have students both virtual as well as in person, um, the strategy for that. And we also had a personal um, amplifier uh, to help with teaching with masks. Um, and so we demoed that. So uh, look out for that. I, I think uh, it went really well and we'll probably add some more sessions um, you know, of those, um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so thank you guys very much. I'm sorry I have to run, um, but it's good to see you guys and have a great last week.
take care. So go ahead. I'll turn it over back to you, Jim. Sorry. No, no, that's quite all right. Thanks, Rosie. Appreciate it. Appreciate all your work getting this set up. Um, Tracy, you have your hand up as well, I see. I appreciate you pointing out the areas on the CTLT website where we can get some quick information, right, to get to get started on these things. Um, I wonder, um, there's an area of CTLT's website that I usually refer students to that's specifically to students, right, to get introduced to different areas of Reginet. I wonder if there's any plans on having some, some help pages for students um, who are in classes that are using these things. Cause I just find that like on my hallway, for example, we all share our like one pagers, right? That we're creating to help get students in. Um, but I wonder if there's gonna be any more kind of coordinated efforts to have some help for students. That's something we can certainly look into if you're talking about these other technologies that we're talking about today. The main reason the ReggieNet one exists, because as we all know, ReggieNet is kind of a customized system for ISU. It's an open source software platform called Sakai that we have uh, um, uh, tinkered with and we work with a community to, to create and maintain. So that's why we created kind of those help things for faculty to give in terms of ReggieNet. In the short term, my suggestion would be if you go to these pages, I wouldn't necessarily refer students to these pages, but again, um, on those pages, there are links to the help sites that the actual software companies have. Um, and there's and there's a lot of getting started and, and stuff like that. And some of them have some really good short videos and whatnot. Um, but that's certainly something I'll, I'll bring up with our technology folks and see if that's something we can work on with a mind towards fall. Um, certainly maybe something for Nearpod and I don't want to speak for Greg uh, or add more work to his um, to his plate but um, since Nearpod is the replacement for the turning point clickers and we used to have similar to what you were talking about for Reginet we used to have that for turning point clickers that might be appropriate to, to try to prioritize okay uh, do we need to request access for Nearpod I see Sherry mentioned in chat um, and Greg has answered in chat at the moment, no. So if you have not been keeping up with chat, there have been some good questions and answers there. Um, we have about seven minutes left. So what other questions do you have? And if not, I, I would invite our, not to put you on the spot, I don't mean to, uh, if you don't want to, that's okay. But for our panelists, if you had one final thought that you wanted to share about the products that you uh, talked about today, about the technology you talked about today, feel free to jump in. I'll put in a quick plug and say that um, if you're interested in using any of these technologies to teach information fluency concepts to your students and want to work with Milner Library, please reach out because we would be really happy to help you with that. And I would just add that I've used all of them except for Padlet um, in, in my classes. And depending on the content, um, they all have great application for what you're doing. But for Flipgrid, for me, that was the one change that I made in my class is, is for them to start thinking about things and to be creative with their stuff, especially in such a dry concept. And my um, midterm scores raised an entire letter grade from just making that one change for them to start being reflective over their learning before we came to class to be creative in how they decided to share that information. Um, and, and they're used to doing that with their social media and they make their own memes and they do those kinds of things anyway um, by getting tapping into stuff that they enjoy more than just writing or whatever the case may be, doing those videos um, made all the difference in the world in my class. Great, thank you both. Um, so as we wrap up here, uh, you can always email ctlt at ilstu.edu. Um, and we keep an eye on that uh, and we will connect you with those who can help you best. So be as specific as you can when you make your, your request or you ask for help. But um, you know, even if you don't know, email us and we'll, you know, if you wanna be general about it and we'll, we'll shepherd those to where they need to go. Um, and so I think we're gonna probably wrap it up. Uh, so thank you again to our presenters. Thank you to all of you for attending. And uh, we will post a recording of this in a few days and we'll, uh, we'll put up a news article and um, try to get out the information, the word on how you can see that at some point soon. So thanks everyone for coming.